Welcome to Extraterrestrial Reality. Uh, before we get into the main course of today's podcast, which will be about encounters people have had with very strange looking extraterrestrials, apparent extraterrestrials, uh, I want to talk about the previous podcast where I was talking about the mysterious planet X. Um, now, I just want to point something out here. Like when I did that podcast, when I was talking about Planet X, I was reading, I was reading an article uh, that had been posted on NASA's website about this uh, hypothetical Planet X. There was some astronomers that believed that there could be another planet, and they, they, they have done some uh, modeling to, uh, and some scientific equations to come up with this uh, uh, hypothetical planet. And uh, the, the re- I think some people misunderstood what I was doing there. Not everybody. It seems like, based on all the comments, it seems like most people understood that I was I didn't mean anything I was saying during that. I, I was using that as a, it, what that was, was an exercise uh, to show what it sounds like uh, when somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about is acting like a, like they, a know-it-all skeptic on a subject. Uh, uh, you know, my complaint is, is that people in, in the uh, astronomy field, like astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, they show, they show up on TV and they're always asked about extraterrestrials and UFOs and they make a big joke up about it. And they don't, and it's always obvious, it's apparent that they have no idea what they're talking about because they never did any research into this. They haven't considered it. They haven't studied it. They, they don't know what they're talking about. They're, that's not their field. And, and it always sounds very demeaning and, and, they, and they, they ridicule people about it. It sounds terrible. And what I did yesterday, that was what I was trying to show was what it sounds like from the other side. If, if, if someone like me, I know nothing about astronomy like these guys do. I, I know nothing about how they came up with this hypothetical planet X, but what I did was uh, I, I deliberately uh, was skeptical of this article and, and, and this research and this hypothetical planet X on purpose. It wasn't, I, I didn't, I didn't mean anything I was saying. I was calling, I was saying all kinds of things, ridiculing these people. I didn't mean it though. And that was the whole point was that how terrible it sounds. And I wanted to sh- show that I wanted to that it was an experiment and I know that before the I started talking about it I said that I said this is an experiment I'm going to do the same thing that the uh, that the uh, astronomers do when they're talking about this and basically they don't know what they're talking about just like I had no idea what I was talking about uh, and then when when I was done with that I, I pointed out like that's I, I have no business basically talking about this because I, I never researched it all I did even before the podcast before I started that podcast I I only did a, a cursory uh, quick read of that article I didn't even I just I knew what I was what, what I was trying to achieve was to show that I don't know what I'm talking about on purpose I'm doing it on purpose to show how stupid these people sound to people who do research into ufos and that was what I, that was the whole point of it but some people uh, did not uh, see that they they thought that i was being serious and that's not what I, I was not being serious not not during that section of that podcast i was not being serious i was just i was being deliberately stupid a, a dumb skeptic who never researched it i was going for that kind of a sound that's what i was trying to do this to show what it sounds like when when you see astronomers talking about people who studied ufos or people who have saw ufos or people who have who have ex- experienced uh or uh, extraterrestrial encounters that's what i was trying to get at but some people didn't get it. in fact one guy uh, sent me a comment on spotify calling me a blanking idiot i guess in a way i should take that as a compliment because that was what i was trying to do i was trying to be show you what how an idiot sounds when they're talking about something they have no business talking about i had no business talking about this hypothetical planet x or the research that was conducted by these astronomers uh, to come up with this hypothetical planet x i don't know what i'm talking about and that's the whole point of it uh and there were some other comments i received on spotify too uh there was okay there was one from uh mark and Mark said, uh, it's reasonable to use modeling to develop a hypothesis regarding currently undiscovered planets. Uh, in fact, that is how Neptune was discovered. Yeah, I'm sure. But I, I was, that wasn't the point of what I was doing, at the, Mark. I was trying to point out that I, that wasn't the, that was, uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to this modeling. I was just showing what it sounds like from the others, to, you know, trying to make a point. And then uh, actually another follower said, uh, Kyle says, 
Uh, Jim, you started uh, you started doubting the maths and process of identifying the missing planet. As Mark wrote here, this is a tried and tested method. You, Jim, don't seem to understand. Exactly, I don't understand. That I wasn't. I'm not. I, that wasn't the point. I'm, I wasn't being serious at that point. But I guess it came off as serious to some. Uh, and I wasn't, maybe I wasn't clear enough in what I was trying to accomplish there. I was just trying to show what it sounds like. But it seems like most people, uh, most from what, what we're reading, uh, 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 the majority of the comments here, it does seem like uh, uh, most people did understand that I, I didn't mean what I was saying. I, these, uh, uh, these, these dismissive comments that I was making, I was just, it was all pretend, it was make believe. Uh, showing them, showing the other side what it sounds like. I was trying to make a point. So for if I wasn't clear enough, I do apologize. But uh, uh, I think the point is, is that someone's providing a commentary on something, uh, uh, on a topic of which they know nothing about. Uh, that's what it sounds like. And that's what it sounds like to me when I hear Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about UFOs because it's like, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. Just like I had no idea what I was talking about yesterday when I was uh, criticizing and dismissing this hypothetical Planet X and the research conducted by these astronomers that pr present this uh, hypothetical planet. That's all it was. So I just want to make clear uh, what I was trying to accomplish there. Anyway, uh, I want to move on now. I want to talk about uh, s some... I have three different cases here. Uh, it seems like every now and then there's I mean, you, you come across cases where the aliens don't look like the uh, regular uh, kind of aliens, if that's what you want to call them, regular. Like regular aliens, meaning the gray aliens, the reptilian aliens, the insectoid aliens. It seems like they're the predominant kinds that people run into all the time. But as I've... On many different podcasts before this too, I've talked about different cases where uh, there are extraterrestrials that people ex see or encounter that are don't uh, conform to any of those uh, sort of descriptions that you any description that you ever ever heard of before. And I'm going to start with a case from 1975 that happened in Japan. And uh, here's an article. I'll leave the links for all these uh, sources that I'm using so you could check all these things out for yourself. Uh, but the first one is called uh, The Fanged Humanoids of Kofu, and this happened in 1975 in Japan. And I'm going to read through this article here. And for those who are listening, uh, I, I am going to be showing uh, some of the drawings that people had submitted uh, to, to show what they saw. But, but I will provide the description as I'm uh, going through this podcast so you can get an idea uh, for those who are just listening to this and not, not seeing it. Anyway, it says here, in 1975, two seven-year-old boys had a face-to-face -face encounter with a pair of fanged humanoids, which, they, which would haunt them for the rest of their lives. Sometime before 7 p.m. on the evening of February 23, 1975, two grade school boys, Masato Kawana and Katashiro Yamahata, were roller skating near the Hanodi Housing Estate in Kamamachi, Kofu City, when they noticed a pair of glittering orange UFOs frolicking in the sky above. So these two seven-year-old kids are out there having a good old time roller skating, and all of a sudden they see UFOs in the sky. The enthralled boys stared in awe as the larger of the two objects broke off and flew toward Mount Otago, while the smaller one slowly descended to the ground, landing amongst the props of a vineyard behind the estate. The boys later stated that the strange aerial objects emitted an odd crackling or ticking sound, not unlike that of a Geiger counter. It goes without saying that the curious youngsters wasted no time in removing their skates and charging into the vineyard to, in order to get a better look at this now earthbound object. As the two second graders approached the formerly orange spacecraft, they saw that it was actually a domed silverish disc which stood approximately 7 feet high and was almost 15 feet in diameter. This classically shaped flying saucer was perched on three ball-shaped legs and had what the children described as strange characters embossed on the me metallic surface of its hull. Let me just stop there for a second. That sounds very similar. Uh, the strange characters that were embossed on the hull of this craft sounds very similar, uh, doesn't it, to the, uh, the strange symbol that uh, Lonnie Zamora, the police officer uh, from Socorro, New Mexico, who in 1964 saw this strange craft uh, land it and then take uh, and two humanoids walking around it, and then it took off right in front of his face and it, it had this strange symbol on it. So some the, obviously these 
these beings, all of these beings visiting us are using some form of language or uh, uh, some form of writing, obviously. Uh, some of them, at least, are, are, are using this, which is interesting. Uh, and in this case, is no different. Anyway, continuing here, it says, Inspecting the craft, both Kawana and Yamahata were astounded, and no doubt a bit frightened, to see a hatch open on the side of the craft and a ladder automatically extending down to the ground below. So to stop there again. These beings use ladders, which I, it's another interesting aspect to this whole phenomenon. You, you hear this a lot. A lot of times you'll hear, uh, sometimes these crafts seem to have ramps, and then sometimes they have ladders that they climb up and down, uh, it, it, just like we have, which I find interesting. It says here, the boys watched in sun, stunned silence as a bizarre humanoid creature disembarked from the ship. It was at that moment that the boys noticed another, smaller, though similar-looking, humanoid that remained inside the control room. Kawana and Yamahata reported that the first creature was long-armed, almost four feet tall, and was clad in a glowing or reflective silver uniform. It says here, the Kofu entity's skin was described as being dark brown and covered in wrinkles so dense that they obscured any noticeable features, save three two-inch long metal fangs so these what these creatures had these three long fangs sticking out of out of their mouths out of their wrinkled mouths and the the beings did look uh, similar to the uh the creatures that the the charles hickson and calvin parker saw in 1973 in uh, pascagoula mississippi those two guys of course were abducted by uh these robotic like creatures that were very tall over six feet tall uh that had this very wrinkled looking uh, appearance to them like wrinkled flesh but they were acted ro like robotic these thing this object or this creature here too was acting this uh, similar way except this was shorter it was four foot uh four feet tall it says here while the silvery fangs are a new twist the wrinkly skin might ring a bell for those who have studied the pascagoula alien abductions the boys also claimed that it had large pointed ears and carried a long object which they said resembled a rifle this strange sightseer apparently began to explore the terrain, seemingly oblivious to the enthralled duo staring at it. That was until it abruptly turned and placed one of its hands on Yamahata's shoulder, patting him twice and uttering a series of sounds that sounded to the boys like a tape recorder running backward. Now that is how to be hor horrifying for these two seven-year-old kids uh, this, to have something like this happen, to see something like this, and then one of them... The, one of this creature touches one of them on the shoulder. Uh, at this point, Yamahata collapsed to the ground, paralyzed. Although his friend believed that this was caused by fear, anyone familiar with so-called close encounters of the third kind can attest that. Uh, human beings are often placed in a state of almost suspended animation by extraterrestrial visitors in, what one must assume, an effort to prevent them from hurting themselves or anyone else. As soon as Yamahata dropped, Kawana, exhibiting a commendable... Uh, courage for one so young rapidly pulled his friend up onto his shoulder and lugged him away from these vampiric alien assailants as swiftly as possible upon returning home the now almost hysterical boys immediately informed their mothers about this bizarre close encounter their curious yet almost certainly incredulous mothers followed their clearly perturbed sons to the back of the Hanodi housing estate where much to their shock they confirmed seeing an orange light pulsating in the vineyard this odd light show continued for five minutes so now you have the mothers back there with the two kids and they're both all of them are now seeing this light so you have multiple witnesses you have two witnesses to the creatures they're all, albeit they're only seven-year-old kids but that doesn't uh, uh, change the fact that they are witnesses and then you have the two adults with them that see the object uh, behind the uh, in the vineyard before the boys could convince their mothers to investigate the strange craft at a closer range, the UFO launched with a burst of light so brilliant, the eyewitnesses were compelled to avert their eyes. It should be noted that while Yamahata and Kawana were the only ones to have actually seen the aliens, their classmate, 8-year-old Ichiro Minagishi, also reported that he saw a shining object flying toward the Hanodi housing estate while he was riding in a car with his parents near the Kofi Bypass approximately one half hour before the boys claimed to have discovered the UFO. So now here you have a fifth witness that saw the craft. So you have three witnesses to the craft, two witnesses to the creatures. 
The following day, Kawana and Yamahata had a captivated audience, audience of students and teachers at the Yamashiro Elementary School as they drew pictures and retold the harrowing tale of the alien encounter. It wasn't long before the buzz enveloped the entire school and the educational authorities with what, at least in the 21st century, seems to be uncharacteristic open-mindedness, decided that they would inspect the area for themselves. So that's interesting. Unlike other cases would happen that where you hear kids involved in uh, alien encounters, like, for instance, the Westall School incident in Australia in 1966, where uh, two to 300 kids and staff saw flying saucers uh, landing, taking off, jets flying around, and then they were told to shut up and never talk about it. In this case, all this, the school, the whole school went out to see the, the, the place where this incident happened uh, the next day. So that, that's very inter- that is very interesting. The school officials arrived armed with whatever gear they could get hold of and immediately noticed that two solid concrete posts had been pushed over at the landing site. It was determined that the boys would have been unable to accomplish this task of ostensibly intergalactic vandalism on their own. <clears throat> yeah, there's no way that two seven-year-old kids, I guess they determined, would be able to do something like that. The investigative team also found what they referred to as landing traces, as well as a ring pattern in the soil near the broken concrete posts where where the UFO landed. Let me just stop there again. So now you have you have two witnesses to the beings, three witnesses to the craft, and a bunch of witnesses, investigators from the school, checking it out, and there's physical landing uh, traces. You can see where it landed. There's a ring pattern. Uh, that's called proof. That's called evidence. Uh, for uh, debunkers out there uh, who uh, talk, who never bring these kind of things up, don't want to talk about landing trace uh, uh, evidence. They don't like that. One school teacher even claimed to have discovered radioactivity within the circular patch. Following the event, both boys were questioned in depth by their parents. Their schoolmaster, Nobu Hushi Kaneko, and noted UFO investigator Masura Mori, and their stories remained alarmingly consistent. Not surprisingly, the, inf- the authorities of the Civil Aviation Bureau of Transportation Ministry claimed that the UFO was nothing more than the lights of the YS-2 propeller pr- plane, which often flew at an altitude of 1,000 meters and was visible to the naked eye. Uh, yeah, of course, the, civ- the, the authorities and we're going to step in. Yeah, uh, just a propeller plane. Uh, yeah, but what about the beings that they saw? Uh, that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I see that's how the authorities always handle this over the years, right? Yeah, it was an airplane, uh, but they don't talk about the beings or the physical trace evidence or any of that stuff, no. In fact, the says here the Civil, Civil Aviation Bureau apparently reserved comment as to whether or not this aircraft could also assume the form of small, pointy-eared, fanged humanoids. Yeah, that's a very strange case. Uh, very strange-looking beings. I mean, when you look at the drawings that the one of the kids drew here, I mean, it looks like uh, like a stocky figure with 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 claws, claw, uh, four finger claws for on each hand, big long pointy ears, and a, a fanged, a big three big fangs in a mouth. But they again, you couldn't they, they couldn't see any details of the features because it was so wrinkly looking. That's basically what you saw was all these uh, wrinkles on this thing. But it sounds similar to the Pascagoula creatures. Uh, or, or I wonder if they're related or if there's beings from a completely different planet. Now, you know, it's interesting, you know, a lot of times people experience, when they're experiencing extraterrestrials, they're always humanoid, aren't they? Uh, no matter what they are, it's always humanoid. And you have to wonder, I guess that's the, the recipe throughout the universe, I would imagine. For intelligent creatures, they, they, they take on a humanoid shape. That's what it, I know a lot of scientists out there will say that that, that just seems unlikely to me. Right, you'll hear it a lot, but then they, but they don't really look at this evidence here. This evidence shows, oh, I mean, how many times, time and time and time again, it's always usually humanoid. I mean, every now and then there's some outliers where these, so I, I, I've read some cases where creatures look like they're like formless f- floating around, but for the most part, they're always humanoid. As are the uh, creatures that we're going to talk about next in the other two cases. Now, the next case is a very strange case. Uh, this is something that happened in 1976 in England, and this was investigated by uh, uh, researcher John Rouse, as well as uh, Jenny Randalls, who, who's written a great number of UFO books, did an incredible amount of research over the years on this. Uh, she's written about this, too, in some of her 
uh, books and also there has been newsletters about this where it was talked about this case. Uh, the occupants in this situation, they were short, only about a foot to a foot and a half tall. I actually uh, was alerted to this case just recently re watching a Preston Dennett episode uh, where he had like 10 different, 10 or 12 different cases he was talking about. And this was one of them. And this one really I found extremely interesting. So we're going to go into this one a little bit. Uh, again, this happened, uh, it, this was a September 3rd, 1976, and this here's a little piece here written by Jenny Randalls. It says here, It is unfortunate that the reporting witness to this case is an elderly lady, age 63, who was very frightened and wishes no pub publicity. There was an 18-year-old witness with her, but she has not so far been traced. However, the investigator for MUFON, John Rouse, believes the case to be genuine. Now, uh, later it was turned out that this uh, 18 year old was the woman's niece. Anyway, Mrs. A and Miss B were returning from a visit to, uh, some relatives. They were walking past a waste area in the little village of fence houses, uh, in County Durham. The area has in fact since been leveled for a building and is littered with dis disused mine shafts. They say, uh, they saw a strange craft upon a, a mound of earth. It was very small and the exact measurements proved possible owing to the events to be described. It was five and a half feet long and three and three to three and a half feet high, roughly oval in shape with a large glass like compartment in the center and a bright orange dome, dome on top. It was resting on a sledge like it was resting on sledge like runners which appeared to be made of chrome or steel the witnesses were not afraid but appeared to be attracted toward the object in almost a hypnotic fashion as they approached closer they noticed an odd effect there had been a moderate wind and scattered cloud in in the uh, twilight sky but the wind seemed to suddenly stop. The trees appeared to stop swaying and traffic on the nearby road seemed to just disappear. The witnesses' watches stopped at this point, although they worked normally afterward. It was almost as if they were uh, suspended in time. So this is a really strange case. So they get close up to this craft and it seems like all of a sudden the wind, everything stops. They can't hear anything. There's no sound either. I was There's a couple different articles on this. Um, and it's like, and, and then later on, they noticed that their watches had stopped. They were 10 minutes behind. Anyway, continuing here, um, it says here, it was almost, uh, it says here, it was almost as though they were suspended in time. Mrs. A was now right up to the craft and she was able to run her hand along the side of it. It was very smooth and glass-like and felt warm. This was the point where she was able to really take in the details of, the, of its size and shape. Suddenly, two entities appeared by the side of the object. Now, let me just stop there. There was another report where I read where they appeared inside of it. Uh, this one here says they appeared beside of it. Anyway, it says here, they were the size of dolls, which we take to mean about one foot tall. Basically, they were humanoid in shape with long white hair parted down the middle. They had large eyes and claw-like fingers. Let me just stop there for a second. When I was a kid and I had the experience with the extraterrestrial showing up in my, my bedroom at night uh, and had three like uh, fingers, three digits on its hand, and they, they came to almost points. I used to, uh, to me, I always used to call it a claw, the claw. That's how I used to always refer to it. But anyway, uh, it says here, basically they were humanoid in shape with long white hair parted down the middle. They had large eyes and claw-like fingers. They appeared to be frightened by the witnesses and put both hands up to their faces. At this point, the story becomes somewhat confused. Witness was not sure what happened to the beings and became a little confused and disoriented, particularly as to time. It is possible that there is a time discrepancy of about half an hour, but there is by no means any certainty about this. The object was seen to take off at great speed, making a humming noise at the time. There was probably a subsequent physiological effect. The next day... Uh, Mrs. A was trying to plug in a vacuum cleaner at her home. She found that she could not put the plug into the socket. It was as if some force were pushing her hands back. Uh, and says here, remember that she had touched the object. In, in, in the end, her daughter had to do this job for her. So I never heard anything like this one before. I mean, the fact that the, you're talking about one to one and a half foot tall doll-like beings with long hair. They're, they said the eyeballs look like marbles stuffed in there. They're wearing these uh, dark suits 
the beings actually put their hands over their face in fear when they saw these people were looking at them. I mean, what a weird, weird story. I mean, I never heard anything like this. But there was actually more to this story that I, I found very interesting. Uh, and this was from uh, more from Jenny Randall's. Uh, the, there was a uh, there was a letter that was sent um, uh, to some UF to a UFO re- researcher about this, and the uh, it says this. This was what this is what the the this was a report that somebody wrote up on this letter. It says the sender says that his wife previously was living with a man who investigated UFOs. She never knew who. Who he did this for, seeing a press story about DI-55, a supposed top secret investigation department, she told the truth. Believe it or not, I have to say she's my wife. Allegedly, this this guy's wife's former boyfriend was involved in some sort of government affair uh, about a UFO landing at fence houses in County Durham. He told her uh, an old lady and her niece had an encounter with, with, with what looked like an egg on skids and two alien beings. She thought him truthful but could not understand why an ordinary man like him could hold such a position. The boyfriend reputedly had a card in his wallet for UFO research called Scorpio and a card with Department of Defense Investigation 55 plus other numbers on it. She knew this well before the press stories. The press stories were before the stories came out in the press about this incident. This woman uh, who she was talking about to her husband about this guy that she used to date. She knew about this long before she read these stories uh, later on in the press uh, about these two doll-like sized beings Uh, anyway it says here one time they were leaving their flat to go into town for an evening out when a huge black bmw car pulled up in front of them and a tall blonde man put his head out of the window and said it started her boyfriend went with him and did not return until 3 a.m uh the next day he acted as if nothing had happened at all this was when she first got suspicious and found a letter with a drawing of the fence house's ufo on it the letter mentioned the old lady touching the ufo time loss but had no sender's address it seemed to have been cut off by her boyfriend possibly in case she found it she then had it out with him he went berserk saying all you have to do is trust me i am on the right side you are protected i have to do this to protect the public you of all people should understand the wife said she believed her ex was using re- UFO research to uh, cover himself and get to the UFO witnesses before the investigators, like the one who uh, was later on investigating this case, uh, uh, looked into it and destroying evidence before it got any further. He was well paid, had a flashy sports car and a small new van. When the black car uh, continued to call at all hours of the night and he refused to talk about it, she got fed up and left him. The letter adds, we do not wish to name him or ourselves because we do not know the consequences. For this reason, I have kept certain facts out. So whoever wrote this letter to these UFO researchers didn't want to say who they were because they were afraid uh, of what co- potential consequences they would face if they were to talk about this publicly. Uh, anyway, I find I find that interesting. So was this getting researched previously? Uh, before UFO researchers, or at the same time that UFO researchers were talking to these people, uh, this woman, this 63 year old woman and her niece, apparently they were talked to at the time by some UFO researchers. Uh, and then they just clammed up and they wouldn't they didn't want to talk about it anymore and then this other story comes out later on where this uh lady uh this husband uh, uh his wife this wife tells her husband about this former boyfriend that she had who was talking about this case before it was ever mentioned in the press it's very interesting and then these people who were getting interviewed by ufo uh, ufo investigators all of a sudden clammed up about it but the story in itself is extremely strange. The the encounter itself, the the beings. I mean, I, I've never heard of anything like this. A foot to a foot and a half tall, and, and a tiny small craft, five foot long. That was it. Wow, really strange. Um, uh, and you have to wonder: is uh, do these extraterrestrials that are coming here? Uh, this seems like there's all different kinds, all different species, probably from all different worlds. Uh, do they do they even know about each other coming here? I mean, what what's going on out there? It's 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 fantastic. Uh, anyway, uh, the final story I want to talk about is, uh, it's, this is a, about a woman in Florida. This happened in 2013. Uh, I did talk about this a long time ago in her, one of my earliest podcasts. I did mention it. And this has since been, it was on some UFO shows on TV and 
Um, anyway, uh, this was uh, this is the here's from uh, Reddit. It says the extraordinary extraordinary encounter of Trish Bishop, who faced an alien presence in her own backyard and managed to capture an image of a foreign object in the process. Uh, and this is, she was talking during an interview. This is what she was saying. It was a Thursday afternoon and I get home from work and I go out on the back porch just to relax. I had been, I had seen what appeared to be this wavy thing. It was above the trees. And this was at the, above the trees in our backyard. It was about 10 to 12 feet in length. And it just sounded like something was walking over there by the edge of the woods, something large. Uh, it was, well, it was somebody asked, uh, I heard a question. Was it something yards? Yeah. I'm sitting there and I'm like, what in the world is that? I'm not thinking alien. I'm, th- I'm not thinking any of that. Uh, that's not going through my head. And all of a sudden I could see him. This thing was a human body, six, two to six, three, uh, very, very well built military type body, but he had a creature's head and he had these massive, very pronounced jaw bones. When I saw his eyes, I thought, uh, he can't, that can't possibly be his eyes because he can't close them. There's no way to close them. And I thought if he knows I can see him, he's going to kill me. Uh, because of the look, stature, and height of the alien being, Trish felt threatened immediately. She created a di- digital sketch of what she saw. Uh, and she did, there was a sketch that she made of this creature. It looks horrible looking. Now, I don't know uh, if this could potentially be a reptilian or something to that effect, but I, I never saw a reptilian described like this. This looks, thing is massive and ugly. I mean, and the eyeballs are like sticking out of its head. And like she said, it doesn't look like it could, would be able to shut its eyeballs. Anyway, she's, she's thinking it's going to kill him. And so I thought if I pretend that I don't see him, then I might be safe. So I just kept playing with my phone, you know, and he just stared at me and then he turned around and he looked into the woods again and turned back around and he took a couple more steps. All I kept thinking was if I dial 911 and the police show up and they see all those cops and everything coming here, he's going to annihilate us. So she was actually thinking in her head that this thing would be capable of not just hurting her, but uh, a police force if it showed up. Uh, so she continues here. says, so he, ta- he takes about five or six, seven steps forward towards that wavy thing. So this wavy thing she's talking about, it's like transparent. She can't, she doesn't know what it is. It's like something moving, but it's like invisible, but you could tell that something's there at the same time. Something like, I guess, right out of Predator. Uh, and then she says, when he enters that wavy thing, everything disappears. So what, what I did was I sat there for a couple of minutes. After a couple of minutes, I got up. I wanted to see if I could see that UFO. She, she couldn't see it. Uh, she couldn't see it anywhere. I didn't, she, and then she, she didn't tell anybody about this for four years because she worked with, with, uh, for government contractors and she has a clearance. So she didn't want to say anything, but she finally did say something late, uh, four, four years later. She contacted MUFON uh, and told them all about it. Uh, here's what she says. She says, it's not something that you just go out and tell people, oh, I saw an alien. I could possibly lose my job. And though she stayed silent for years, she never forgot the encounter in her backyard. But she did later on install a hunting tracker. It's a motion-triggered camera used to track game in her backyard. And she aimed it at where she had seen the alien. And her trail cam was triggered to take a photo after rapid uh, detecting rapid motion. And there was a UFO that appeared uh, at some, some point after her encounter. There, a UFO did take a... She, her camera that she set up this... Uh, it did imagine it ma- managed to take a photo at a different date. Uh, and it says here, photo analysis conducted by MUFON concluded that this object was 27 feet wide and 12 to 13 feet long with no visible means of propulsion. So there was another amazing case with another amazing looking creature. Three stories. You have the, the first one in, in Japan from 1975 where the uh, you have this uh, uh, creature, I've never heard a description like that before, with these long, a uh, four foot tall with long pointy ears, so wrinkled looking you couldn't even make out a, any sort of features. Uh, the only thing that was noticed by these two seven-year-old kids was these three long fangs hanging out of its mouth. Um, it was carrying some sort of an object that looked like a rifle, and it touched the one kid. I've never heard of a description like that before. And, of course, the second story was extremely strange. Uh, these people, the two people that approached this craft, a uh, uh, 63-year-old woman and an 18-year-old, they approached this craft. All of a sudden, it's like time stops. Uh, their watches were 10 minutes slow after after the incident was over. And, uh, and they see these two foot... And uh, one foot tall to a foot and a half tall creatures with long white hair, marble-like eyes, uh, with claw-like hands, 
Uh, I never heard anything like that before. And they and, and all the traffic around and all of a sudden everything stopped. It was like time stopped. And then there were after effects the next day when this uh, grandmother was trying to plug in her uh, vacuum cleaner. She couldn't put the plug in the wall. Kept on, she just couldn't do it. There was some force preventing her from doing it. And her daughter had to come over to put it in for her. Now, what the hell was that all about? I never heard anything like that before. And of course, the other uh, addendum to that story is the potential reality that it was something that was uh, looked into by some UFO, secret UFO uh, branch of the government that investigates this kind of stuff. We don't know if that's true or not. That was based on the on a letter that was sent anonymously, and we don't know. Could have that could have that that part of it could have been a hoax. But the first part of it, the encounter itself, was not a hoax. It was in, investigated by uh, different people, and then the people actually did clam up, and they did not want to talk about it after that. And that's understandable. And then, of course, the the final case, the 2013 case uh, in Kissimmee, Florida, where it, where that happened. This woman sees this strange object hovering at the edge of her yard, and it, she can't really she can't see. She just sees this wavy thing, some kind of wavy thing in, in the, around the trees, and she's hearing walking at the edge of her property near a forest. And next thing you know, she sees this creature, this six two six three tall creature, this tall being with 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 a monstrous face. With eyeballs that were sticking out of its head that didn't look like it would would that it could close them ever that there was no way to even close them, and she was scared out of her mind. She just sat there and pretended she didn't see it until it finally climbed climbed into that craft and then it just disappeared. But then later on, at a different date, after she installed this camera, uh, she actually captured some sort of a craft flying away uh, from the same spot uh, where she had seen the creature. So that's an amazing story. Uh, all, all these stories are amazing and uh, it just goes to show that there are beings out there uh, sometimes they're not greys, sometimes they're not insectoids and sometimes they're not reptilians we don't know what they are and it, has to, it makes you wonder like, just how many things are coming here uh, I, I do, I believe that this whole universe is just teeming with all kinds of life out there. I think it's just teeming with an intelligent life. And a lot of it's stopping here for whatever reason, just to check it out and then maybe go off on their uh, merry way off to another planet, just like Star Trek. That's what it seems like to be. Uh, it's real. These people aren't making these stories up. There's just so many of these kinds of stories, so many. And when you, when you, if you were to compile them and look at all of them, you would realize that this is something that's really happening. All these people are not lying. And obviously these beings have abilities that we just can't even dream of. I mean, that 1976 incident uh, in uh, fence houses uh, in the UK, I mean, that, that, that incident there, I mean, time stopped, it seemed, for these people. And they had weird, weird after effects from it. Uh, the government apparently seemed, was interested in it. Uh, there's just so many different uh, incredible stories out there. And it just all of them, when you put it all together, it tells you, wow, there's something big going on here. There's all kinds of life out there. And this, there, these stories, uh, uh, these UFO stories, extraterrestrial encounter stories, it's really happening, folks. Uh, uh, and the more you 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 look into this, the more you realize just how uh, widespread it really is. And there's and how many stories like uh, a lot of UFO researchers will point this out to you. How many have we not heard about? Well, how many story? How many UFO uh, reports never get UFO sightings never get reported? How many encounters with extraterrestrials never get told to anybody? Uh, I would imagine that's probably that, that number is probably higher than the ones that have been reported. <sighs> Anyway, uh, I want to say thank you all for joining me. Until next time.